In the 1890s, toward the end of his life, the immensely popular French academic artist Jean Léon Jérôme created an extraordinary series of paintings involving the figure of truth personified as a naked woman, at first stuck in a well and then emerging from the well with a fierce sense of determination, indignation, and retributive fury. And truth, in the final version, isn't messing around. It's clearly payback time, and the whip Naked Truth brandishes isn't any casual flogger. It's a cat of nine tails with lead weights on the ends designed to cut into flesh, leave rivulets of blood, and then later scars. And there's something universal about her howl of indignation. It's not just personal. It's a general cry. Edward Munch's The Scream, Ginsburg's Howl. There's something terribly amiss in our world that needs redressing. Truth has been stuck in the well far, far too long, and the world has been complacent in its web of deceit, evasion, pretense, and posturing. But now Truth has emerged from her well, and she's coming on strong. What a wild, haunting, and evocative painting. But Truth emerging from her well is not typical of Jerome's work, so let's take a look at some of his earlier work to see how he got here. Both as painter and sculptor, Jean-Léon Jerome was very much the darling of the French Academy. His historical scenes displayed an uncanny power to transport viewers back in time to the historical events he portrayed. And exemplifying the ideals of Academy painting, Jerome's works were so finished, with brush strokes invisible under skillful blending, Jerome created a slick, illusionist surface that many contemporaries remarked felt like he had captured life itself. Jerome's many scenes of Turkish baths were among the most revered of all paintings of the then thriving genre of Orientalism. Viewers could escape into a wonderland of sensualized and frequently eroticized world of an imagined Middle East or North Africa far from the pedestrian concerns of day-to-day -day life. Though many painters, including Jerome, journeyed to Istanbul and other destinations in the Middle East or North Africa, these paintings were as much dreams and fantasy as any accurate representation of those exotic other worlds. And Turkish baths were the favorite of all Orientalist subjects. But even here, Jerome distinguishes himself by being more concerned with the social interactions of the people in the baths or with their direct engagement with the viewer by looking at them than the voyeuristic through the keyhole perspective that was so often a standard part of Turkish bath pictures. I'm fascinated by the woman in the bath staring at the viewer every bit as intensely as they are looking at her. What Jerome does with light streaming through the interior, exploding into what looks like fire, is just stunning. And even the hookahs, which are everywhere, seem here more an exploration into other parts of consciousness on the part of the smokers than any mere escape from life. And what about this stunning panorama showing the vast, illimitable infinitudes of sky and the nude immersed in all that space and splendor? Sublimity of space, sublimity of body. I love the sense of her immersion in sky. And think of the poet Navala saying the seed of the soul isn't deep within, but rather it's the intersection of the inner world and the outer world. She is enfolded in infinitudes, and I imagine her in psyche and song singing of the splendor of that sky. It's one measure of Jerome's genius. 
he would quite frequently tackle a subject or theme for painters and produce something quite extraordinary. Here's one example. Painters have long been fascinated with the Bacchants, or Maenads, or whining wilderness and tranced followers of Dionysus. In Euripides' Bacchae, we watch the Bacchants grow ever more wild and entranced before their celebration goes amiss. Here is Bouguereau's version of a Bacchant. And here is one by Max Nunnenbruck. And here's a Bacchant by Joaquin Sorolla. I think they're terrific paintings, but Jerome's is my favorite by far. She is so inward and pensive and human and tender and intelligent and reflective and yet so utterly possessed and transformed by animal spirits. Even her body is changed, taking on the wildness of the goat. She becomes part goat. I love this painting. I think it leaves all the other versions of Bacchants far behind. Most of the Jerome paintings we've seen here would have been on display one time or another at the annual April exhibition at the Paris Salon, where viewers would jostle each other in front of their favorite works by Massenet or Bouguereau or Cabanel or Jerome. Of course, there was fierce competition among painters to earn the right to be exhibited. And there were many works the Academy rejected, deeming them to be of insufficient quality or representative of dubious aesthetic principles. But 160 years ago this month, something extraordinary happened, which changed the world of art forever, though probably no one quite realized the epochal importance of the event at the time. That year of 1863 in April, for the first time, the works that were rejected by the Academy had their own exhibition the Exhibition of the Rejected, and it was just across the boulevard. These were the paintings that challenged the conventions and academy strictures of paintings. These are the paintings that rejected the merit of the invisible, skillfully blended brushstroke. These were the paintings that relished in displaying paint on canvas in bold and visible swatches with brushstrokes clearly visible to every viewer. And these were the paintings that complicated the relation between painter and model or subject and viewer, returning gazes with complex, direct, and inquiring stares. And these were the paintings that rejected the impossible idealisms of the Academy's fetish for unblemished, creamy, smooth, and utterly hairless, and ultimately inhuman flesh, and the Academy's endless recycling of figures and scenes from classical mythology, creating idealized figures that never took a real human breath. And these were the paintings that gave us subjects and scenes one might encounter on the street or in a cafe, in real life. And artists like Monet or Manet or Cezanne or Corbet or Whistler, who had been rejected by the Academy, now had a place to display their brave new explorations of a very real world, and had a place to explore a more complicated and de-idealized and more authentic relation to the visible world. After all, we see with our whole being and whole minds, and not just our eyes. So the idea of what is truth in painting was a burning subject among painters and was hotly contested terrain. And the strictures of the academy, which were a good fit with the polish and finish of Jerome, probably weren't going to take anyone that far toward the real or toward 
truth. So, in 1863, when you're tired of illusionist surfaces and endlessly idealized figures drawn from recycled mythologies at the April exhibition, you could journey across the boulevard and experience something quite different. So, to return to Jerome's 1896 truth coming out of her well to shame mankind, certainly the painting is energized by Jerome's own lifelong struggle to find truth in painting, and it's probably energized by Jerome's despair over being upstaged by younger painters passionately exploring more subjective versions of the truth of the visible world. And this work from 1896 is really a symbolist painting as well. The world had changed on Jerome. The 1890s were the great decade of symbolist works which give voice to the language of dreams and to the realities of the unconscious. In a way, the image makes more sense against the background of dreams. Emerging from the depths of the well, she makes a great figure of our unconscious psyches that simply cannot be silenced anymore. And it's no coincidence that at the time Jerome was painting it, hundreds of artists and poets and novelists were exploring dreams and the collective unconscious and exploring symbolic forms. It's no coincidence either that at the very moment Naked Truth is climbing out of her well, Freud was deeply immersed in his writing of the interpretation of dreams, which would be the epochal work of the symbolist and psychoanalytic age and would be published just three years after Jerome's Truth Emerging from the Well painting. And the very journey up from the underground or underworld and out of the well restages the journey of the chthonic goddesses who enthralled painters and poets. After all, goddesses like Hecate and Persephone brought some of the chthonic powers of the underworld back with them. The well might not be Hades, but naked truth still enacts the journey up from the underworld, climbing those dark, wet, chthonic, earthly powers and claiming them. Jerome's personification of truth is ferocious and smart and determined and bringing mythic forces with her. And truth's emergence from the well certainly draws resonance and power from the ancient association of water and femininity with life, creation, and rebirth. A well is everywhere a place of succor and sustenance that makes life possible, and so she gains power from the mythic linkage of well, water, and life force. And truth here, and her indignant and enraged scream, is not just a personal cry of despair, but takes on the quality of a universal voicing. It's Edward Munch's The Scream and Kath Kalowitz's figures screaming at the endless violent unmaking of her character's worlds. Her howling extends right to that of Yeats and later Ginsburg's howl that the best lack all conviction and the worst are full of passionate intensity. So her screams not just for herself, but for everyone against silencing and against human folly and against deceit in general. And Naked Truth, emerging from the well, is enraged at having been silenced so long. In this sense, she's a feminist and political icon of those too long silenced, too long disenfranchised, locked in a well of silence and loneliness. In this sense, the 1896 paintings, part of a growing discourse of removing the gags, suffragette, get the vote, get the voice. She is not ever returning to the well. She will be silenced no more forever. And there is some serious retraining to do. Truth is a difficult thing. She's confronting a world of layered deceits and dissimulation. She's going to need her whip 
with its lead studs on the tip. It is 1896, and there is hell to pay. There is blood to let. The emergence of truth is no easy thing. But then, what about this? In the simplest sense, don't you just love her? Love her energy and savage indignation and strident climb over the walls of the well? And don't you take some comfort in her absolute insistence that there is truth beneath all our human chatter and noise and folly? I love Jerome's painting. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, I imagine you might like the Hogarth video I recently released, or the video on Circe, who is endlessly fascinating, and have a video on John Singer Sargent coming up soon, and then one on the influential 1920s pulp black mask. So please subscribe.